up in the book of Mark again as we're making our way through the through this book and we're looking today at Mark chapter 6 and the first six verses Mark chapter 6 and the first six verses I'll just shift this thing otherwise I'll get fouled up okay verse 1 Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown And his disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief and he was going around the villages teaching. Trust that God will add a blessing to his word. In a few weeks I propose making another trip to New Zealand and um, when we go there we usually travel to familiar places mainly because that's where our family are etc and we certainly will be catching up with them and we'll be going to our hometown, actually a hometown where I myself probably spent around 40 years of my life. We'll be looking at family, uh, catching up with family and particularly my mother, we'll be catching up with her and um, 87 years old and she's in a nursing home and I hope she'll remember me. She will remember me but she'll want to know where I am and where I live and so forth but that's okay. And, um, And if I let people know early enough before I go back to New Zealand, I more than likely will get an invite to preach at the local Brethren Assembly where some members attend who have known me for 50 years. I'm really showing my age now, right? And from past experience, if I do preach there, there won't be astonishment at my preaching. Like, Jesus received when he preached in the synagogue. There'll be a mixed mixed response as I think back at the numbers of times I've preached and and heard other people preach there as well. Some will greatly appreciate the word of God and they'll let that be known. Others will be so poker-faced that you don't even know if you've connected or not. And being a rural community and most of them have got farming on their mind, they will arrive so late that you're halfway through the message which really indicates that your preaching and the message of God's word is not a priority in their scale anyway. And I guess any pastor, any preacher who gets those responses will in some way respond himself one way or the other. Well, in our text that we've read this morning, Jesus makes a visit to his hometown. I wonder what he did there. Did he visit those familiar places? Did he go to those places and drift down memory lane like I often do when I go back home and try or and connect different events in my life in different places, etc.? Did he meet people on the streets in the market square that he had known for 30 years? Because Jesus was 30 plus at this time, right? No doubt he probably did. He certainly would have met family. This certainly would have been a great opportunity for Jesus to catch up with his mother Mary. His mother and his brothers, you will remember, his family, they kept the tab on Jesus. You remember back in chapter 3, when we're looking at chapter 3, 
His family was sort of going with the crowd and saying, hey, look, this Jesus, one of our immediates, our brother, my son, as it were, has lost it. He's gone off his rocker. We better go and protect him. And so they may go down to Capernaum and they try and pull him away from the house where he was performing miracles and teaching. So they kept the tab on Jesus. But now Jesus was back in town. This would have been, actually, I'm thinking, a great moment and opportunity for Jesus to put things right on that score, right? So here was Jesus, the Nazareth homeboy. He had returned. And guess what? He's going to be preaching at the synagogue on the Sabbath. Of course, this is not the first time Jesus had returned or visited Nazareth when he had taken up his ministry, which went for about three, three and a half years. At his baptism, you know, being about 30 years old, and he had three, three and a half years ministry before he was crucified, this was not the first time he returned to Nazareth. The first time was soon after his baptism. He obviously came from Nazareth all the way down to the Jordan. More than likely... Opposite Jerusalem area, down in the, in, the, in the Jordan there. And so he went there, but he went back to Nazareth. The first time. What was the response to him the first time? You see, very early, probably two years prior to this, very early, even a year into his ministry, he had gained a reputation. He'd already performed miracles. He'd already been noted as a, as a teacher. And so he went back the very first time and he there was received as a hero. Luke 4.22 tells us that they spoiled, all spoke well of him and were wanting the miracles done in Capernaum to be done among them also. So the first time he was received well, as it were. You see, these guys in Nazareth at this time, they wanted the health and the wealth and the prosperity that Jesus could give without the faith and the repentance and the commitment. And so there on that first time, Jesus gets up into the synagogue like he's doing this time that we're reading of, but the first time, two years earlier, he gets up and he opens the scriptures and he reads from Isaiah. And he says at the end of his sermon, today the scripture has been fulfilled among you. And just to make a long story shorter, what he was basically saying there was that the scripture is fulfilled. Understand that I am your promised Messiah and you are the unrighteous captives that need to repent and be set free from the bondage of sin. Wow, what a confronting message, okay? What was the response to his sermon that time? They were enraged. They were enraged at this this indictment from the carpenter's son. How dare this homeboy, this ordinary, make such outrageous claims. And you know what they did? They tried to take him and drop him off a cliff and kill him. How is that for a response just to one sermon? But now he has returned. He's returned again more than likely about two years later. Things had changed somewhat for Jesus since he was here first time. They had changed somewhat. When he left Nazareth earlier, he had left alone. But now here he was, he had returned, and, and he had a, had a group of disciples following him. Now he looked like some respected rabbi, because that's what rabbis did. They had a group of disciples who followed him. Things had changed somewhat. So he was this carpenter's son, now the great proven teacher because his reputation had grown somewhat in two years. Jesus was a busy man, right, as we've been looking at. And more than likely at this stage, just about all disease and and affliction had been eradicated right throughout the land of Palestine because Jesus was on the move. And so his reputation had grown somewhat and, and so he comes back to home with a band of devoted disciples following him. And as a footnote here, as we go into this, I think this is going to be a powerful lesson to those disciples. This is going to be a powerful lesson to them on how to handle rejection. 
Because the following section, Jesus sends these disciples out, if you read on. He sends them out, and one of the instructions to give them, if they reject you, this is what you do. So this, was, this little section of here, of when Jesus' response in Nazareth was going to be a lesson for the disciples. But anyway, he returns with them. But as you think about the return, two years maybe had gone by, it certainly gives you time, doesn't it? Time always gives you, gives you opportunity and allows people to consider and perhaps reevaluate things and maybe to have a change of heart over things. And uh, this certainly would have given Nazareth some time to do that. But had these people changed? Remember the first time they tried to kill him? Two years later, here he is back in hometown and home again. Had they changed? Had their minds been changed in regard to this, this carpenter's son who was so familiar with him to them? Well, we're going to look at some of the responses and I think we can gauge then if they changed or not. There's three responses recorded in this little section. Two responses from those, I'll call them the Nazarites, the Nazarenes. Two responses from the Nazarite and the final response is the one of the Lord Jesus. The first response is found in verse 2. We see that they were astonished. They were astonished. In all my pe- preaching, I have never had people astonished. <laughs> now, there's probably obvious reasons for that. <laughs> and I can understand, so we can all have a laugh. And then I'm thinking, well, I've never actually been astonished or astounded at anyone else's preaching either. How am I missing something here? But this is the response that the people had toward Jesus' preaching. I think we need to understand and have a look at what this astonishment, you may have amazement or you may have astounded in your translation, all very good words, synonymous with one another. What does it tell us? Well, if we go back to the previous chapter in verse 42, which we dealt with a few weeks ago, we'll see in verse 42, chapter 5, the same word used there. And it's the same word is used as, as a summary, generally speaking, of all the region of Galilee toward Jesus himself and what he did. And it says there, immediately they were completely astounded. This is to do with the raising of Jairus' daughter. Remember, we looked at that. They were immediately and completely astounded. And that depicts a general summary of all Galilee and if you like is a microism of what all the land of Israel were toward the Lord Jesus. So primarily the Galilean response was one of curiosity and astonishment. Now that in itself is not a bad thing, folks. Okay? That in itself is not a bad thing, to be astounded or astonished at the ministry of Jesus and particularly his teaching. Because as you know, his greatest work was teaching and his miracles sort of came in second. That's how it was. But when we think of astoundment and astonishment, that in itself, even though it is not a bad thing, that in and of itself does not equal repentance, it does not equal salvation. But they did have some interest and there was astonishment at the miracles he performed. That's what they were after. They were, they were into, the, into the miracles that he performed, the things that they could see. In other words, there were, there were lots of thrill seekers here. People who wanted to be healed and delivered from demons. They wanted to see the power of Jesus in action. And now here, on the Sabbath day, in Nazareth, preaching, the people were literally astounded, amazed at his sermon, at his message. Now this word astounded, amazed, astonished, what it means is to, is to strike out, okay, or expel by a blow. Or another one is to force out or cast off by a blow. So it's a pretty savage, severe, clear-cut sort of an expression. Figuratively speaking, this word expresso, or expresso means to drive out of one's senses by a sudden shock of feeling. 
Okay? To drive out one of one's senses by a sudden shock or feeling. In other words, Jesus is preaching, I'll put it in colloquial terms, fair knock the wind out of their sails. Or a more modern one perhaps, his preaching blew their minds, it blew them away. You see, when Jesus preached, folks, it was really something else, right? Really something else. He was the preacher par excellence. And it was right that those who did hear him were astounded, astonished, amazed. Because he was the best of the best. And every word he spoke was absolute truth because he was God, the Son of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And his preaching was no way ordinary like mine. Actually, Scripture describes his teaching in many ways. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, he's declared there that his preaching is authoritative. John chapter 7 tells us there that his, his preaching was, was knowledgeable. In Luke 4.32, it describes his preaching there as powerful. John 7.46 tells us that no man ever spoke like this man. It was unmatched. And all this without ever having to go to a homiletics class or have a rabbi teach him or some seminary training. But to Nazareth, to Nazareth, here the Sabbath day, he was nothing but a homespun boy from their town. Nazareth, this despised place, at this stage of history, a village of no more probably than 500 people, a backwater place, on a place to nowhere. So much so that the saying went around, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? So with all this background nurture, the people on this day listened to him and they were astounded at what he said. This astonishment, this response was a shock to their underdog egos, as it were. It sent them spinning for one of their own to have such knowledge, such authority, such power. And for them, it was just too much. How could this homespun boy, this carpenter, a mere son of Mary, teach this way, way beyond his social and intellectual status. How could that be? So they were astonished. They were blown away. As I said before, nothing wrong with astonishment. But the problem is with astonishment, what it does on this occasion, and what it did on this occasion, it obscured the obvious. They're astounding Astoundment and their astonishment, their amazement, it obscured the obvious. It obscured truth about Jesus being the Son of God. It obscured their need of repentance. It obscured their need of salvation. It obscured God's truth and it revealed their unbelief. Anyone can be astounded, anyone can be astonished or amazed as much as they like about Jesus, but it will not bring you eternal salvation. And as we'll see, astonishment, amazement, that is not linked to genuine belief in God's revealed truth. Genuine, heartfelt belief in God's truth always results in, you know what, in a a hardened heart of unbelief. And that always has horrendous consequences, folks, always. So that was the first response. What was the second response? second response was, we see in verse 3, that they took offence at him. Now remember, these Nazarites, they knew Jesus well. He was one of them. They had known Jesus from day one, right from when he was a boy. They had watched him grow. They had known him as a teenager. They had known him when he turned 21. They They had known him as a young man. They had listened to him and they saw him and they watched how he responded to to various situations in life. 
And they'd all drawn their conclusions about him. Just like we, when we hang out with one another, after a while, we begin to sum people up and draw conclusions about one another, right? We do that. That's what we are as human beings. Don't be frightened, but most of you here whom I know, I've drawn conclusions. Now, they may be wrong conclusions. God forgive me if that is the case. Not necessarily judgmental, but we all have that. We sum people up. And we come to some kind of conclusions of where that person's at and what they're doing and what they're about, etc., etc., and who they are. Well, these Nazarites had come to conclusions about Jesus. Now, some of them, of course, who were believers, like his immediate family, his mother, at least, and his brothers, they had drawn conclusions that he indeed was the Son of God even though they may not have been clear on all the details and even though they may have had moments of doubt. But they had drawn the conclusions that indeed he was someone really, really special and indeed he was the Son of God. But many people in Nazareth had not drawn that conclusion. To them, we will see in our text, he was nothing but Mary's son. That's interesting, isn't it? Mary's son. And I'll make it plain here, this was no elevation of Mary. This was a slur on Jesus himself. You see, because even today, in Middle Eastern culture, and particularly in biblical culture of this era, you were known as your father's son, even if he had died or if he hadn't. So if your father had passed away, you were known as the son of your father. But here, Jesus is Mary's son. Not Joseph's son, not God's son. These guys were really sitting on the fence on this. Probably not sitting on the fence, but they've made their minds up here. Now, we do understand that more than likely, Joseph was dead by this stage. And that could well be the case. But what was going down here it's more likely that they were looking upon Jesus as an illegitimate. In other words, we're not sure who this father really is. So we'll call him the son of Mary. Now that was a slur. That was an indictment on the person of Christ. And so here they were really showing their colours here, right? They'd made their minds up. They'd come to some conclusions. You see, even the hard-nosed Jews... Of Galilee, John 6.42, this is what they said. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Even they gave some acknowledge to the father, but here there's these Nazarites, the son of Mary. But now he is home and he's teaching and instructing and even rebuking his own home people. Who on earth does this layman think he is confronting us with Yahweh's word? No doubt would have been the thought going down at this time. And because of this preached word, they were offended at him. Their unbelief obscured the most obvious conclusion ever, that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Even the Pharisees could say, this man is is doing signs. This man is doing miracles. John 11. But in Nazareth, the crowd there was filled with so much scepticism that they even ignore the irrelevant. Or they ignore the, or shall I say, they ignore the, the miraculous miracles that he performed and they fire at him a whole tirade of irrelevant questions. In other words, they obscure the obvious by all these ridiculous, sceptical questions. We get people like that, right? Some of us on on Thursday night were talking about sceptical people like that when you tell them about God and how powerful he is. They say, what if he's so powerful? Why doesn't he do this? Or can he do this? And can he do that? And ridiculous things like make a round hole square or make a, a, a two mountains with no valley between. Can he do that? It'd be so bad. Yet they cover up the most obvious. They obscure the obvious truth with sceptical, irrelevant questions. And this is what these people were doing. It was obvious that he had a divine power. 
It was obvious that he taught divine truth, but unbelief obscures the obvious, folks. It does. Now, there's a good lesson here for us. Did you know that the most obvious truth about God is right here in the Word of God? Forget about visions. Forget about dreams and impressionable feelings and the so-called miraculous. Forget about those things. Even creation itself and even the conscience that God has given us, they are in and of themselves limited compared to the powerful obvious truth that is in the Word of God. And so if you're not reading the Word of God, if you don't know anything about the Scriptures or what God says about Himself and about you from the Scriptures, you are no better than these Nazarites. You're obscuring the obvious by whatever else. His word is perfect, Psalm 19 tells us. His word is perfect and pure and is sufficient to restore the soul, to make a person new in Christ. It contains this word, all that we need to know about him and about ourselves. But unbelief, the unbelieving heart, will sceptically question its authority with all sorts of irrelevant questions. So what happens is that this this sceptical unbelief that obscures God's truth, it has serious eternal consequences. I think we all should understand that. Jesus said the same thing in Luke chapter 16, verse 31. He said this, If they do not believe Moses and the prophets, that's God's word, the law, the Torah, if they do not believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe even if one rose from the dead. Now you can take that from God's word. That's the truth. What had just happened here in our text? The resurrection had taken place, right? Like Nazareth is only probably 25, 30 k's away from, maybe a few more k's than that, from where he had been working. And believe me, news travelled fast in, in, in Palestine with the, with, with the way things were. A, a resurrection had just happened and now they were hearing from Moses and the prophets, the Torah, the law, the word of God, being preached by Jesus, but because of their unbelief, they were offended by the message and also the messenger. He hadn't come to Nazareth with a display of miracles like he did in Capernaum. No, he didn't. He didn't come healing the multitudes and casting out demons like he had in Capernaum. Maybe that's what they were expecting. Maybe they wanted that kind of spectacle in their own backyard. But here he was, he was preaching to them, giving them truth. And they were offended by him. No doubt his message confronted them with the need to repent, just like the first message when he came back two years ago. And I have absolutely no doubt at all that he would have made his message very plain and very clear to them on that day. We're not told the content of the message in this one in this section. But you know what? This was a, this would be the final time he came to Nazareth. Scripture does not record him ever returning to Nazareth again. This was his final, final, final time in Nazareth. There's no record of any shouts for joy. No record of people clapping their hands in outbursts of thanks for praise to God. No thanksgiving at the very idea that such a one would grace themselves would grace himself into their presence. This backwater village leading to nowhere. No thanksgiving for that. There was only offense and sheer disappointment and resentment that were offended by Jesus. And Jesus sums this whole sad scenario up in verse 4, and this is what he says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and among his own people. This little section has caused me to ask folk a question. Can we be offended by Jesus today? Of course the unbeliever, the person who has never accepted Jesus Christ as Saviour, the person who is not a child of God, is just like the Nazarene, right? Or the Nazarite. They will not submit to the commands of Scripture where God commands all men to repent and believe the Gospel. That's their problem. 
They will not submit to the Word of God because they don't know the Word of God and, and they, they haven't been taught from the Word of God maybe that they need to be saved. And every one of you here this morning are without excuse. Jesus says in his word, commands in his word, that you need to be repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your own personal saviour. So you need to understand that. And so, as we think about this as believers, what about believers? Us who have been on the road of faith for a while, can we be offended as well at Jesus? You know, I was thinking about this and I'm thinking of the gospel message, the wonderful message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You know, it's a hard sell in today's world, right? The message itself is offensive to the world. The world would look at this message that says that there's only one way of salvation. As we had Benji tell us this morning, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, that is divisive and it's offensive in our world today. It's dogmatic and you name it. They don't like it. And so we live in a world, that, even a religious world, that would say, surely God's love allows more inclusiveness. Surely it's more than that. And so what happens, sad to say, the message of the gospel and even Jesus himself is portrayed as a Mr. Nice Guy who will put his arms around everyone and as a God and a Saviour who will only bless and he will never punish. He is never a God who is, who is wrathful against sin. That's not what the Word of God says, folks. That's not what the Word of God says. So what kind of Jesus do you present to people, folks? Maybe it's we're offended or we show our offence because we're too afraid to speak to people about the cross and about the gospel. Is truth, the truth of the gospel, about the Lord so offensive to us? Is it such an embarrassment Surely he is everything to us. He's our saviour, our Lord, the one whom we love because he first loved us. Surely his worth and his beauty and his, his attractiveness and his eternality and his promises and his sacrifice that he's made for us deserve our willing and accurate proclamation. Amen? Let us be bold, but never, ever offended. Thirdly, and finally, we will see that this time there is another response recorded in this section and this is where Jesus is amazed with them. He's amazed with them. We see this in verse 6. You know, the first time Jesus preached in the synagogue after his baptism, they tried to kill him. We've looked at that. And, and this time we see their attitude it hasn't changed. They don't try to kill him. But this section is all about their final rejection. You get that? It's all about their final rejection of Jesus. Their unbelief is such that Jesus is amazed and he wonders at their unbelief. Now the word wonder, the word marvel, that you may have in your translation, it means to, to stand in wonder and amazement. Jesus is said to have marveled only twice in Scripture. Only twice. And both times it has to do with faith. The first time it was to do with the centurion. You remember the centurion came to Jesus and said, Jesus, my servant is sick. sick. If you come and just say the word, you don't even have to enter my house, just say the word, I know that he'll be healed. And Jesus marveled at his faith. The second time is here in our text. But this time he marvels at their unbelief. You know what belief is? When we talk about belief, it's exercising faith. And, and, and faith is integral, folks. You know, to be accepted by God and to become one of God's children, to be saved, to be born again, whatever you like to tag it with, it's not about going through some religious ceremony. I don't care how many times you come to church, I don't care how many times you pray, unless you have exercised personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ, had a dealing with him personally yourself, you are still outside of the kingdom. You are not a child of God. So 
So exercising our faith is integral to blessing and acceptance and to be reconciled with God. Hebrews 11 tells us, without faith it is impossible to please God. And so the Bible has a whole lot to say about belief. A whole lot to say about it. But you know what? It's also got a whole lot to say about unbelief. As belief is so powerful and integral in in the destiny that will follow, unbelief is also powerful and it also will determine a destiny to come. Unbelief is powerful. It was unbelief, if you will remember, that, that brought a curse on all humanity. It was unbelief that broke up the fountains and dropped rain from heaven that drowned the entire human race. That's all right. Those guys are not responding to my sermon. They're going to catch an airplane. Okay? It was unbelief in God's Son that catapults people into hell. That's how powerful unbelief is. Unbelief activates divine wrath. Unbelief activates divine judgment. It's so powerful having a heart of unbelief. So powerful. And this amazed Jesus. He wondered at it. How can that be, we might say? After all, here is one who can see the, the stars of all the galaxies that haven't even been seen by man yet. He can see every one of them. He can look into the depths of the ocean where man has never explored. He can see to the very centre of earth that is always a mystery to man. He can see it all and never has it been recorded that Jesus wondered and, amazed, and was amazed. He said that it was very good when he made it. But here he is amazed. He wondered at their lack of faith, their unbelief. And Mark goes on to make the comment that Jesus was unable to perform miracles in that town except for a few healings. Why? Because of their unbelief. Now this doesn't mean to say that just because the people didn't believe that determined what Jesus could do or what he could not do. It doesn't mean that he, the people's unbelief short-circuited and cut Jesus' ability off in relation to what he could do because we know that Jesus is sovereign, right? He's absolutely sovereign. He can do what he wants and he can do to whom what he wants, when we, when he likes. And so our faith or lack of faith, it doesn't pose a problem for the Lord. But in this case, their unbelief brought about a situation where Jesus refused to cast his pearl before swine, as it were. They refused the message, thus they forfeited the miracles. Folks, God's blessing, God's blessings are not the works of healing and making you healthy, wealthy and wise. No way. The greatest work of God is saving and sealing and securing lost souls. And many here can give testimony. Once we were lost, but now we are found. Praise the Lord. The greatest work of God is saving people spiritually. But what a tragedy when people hear the truth about God, they see the truth for themselves, and they ignore it and they turn a deaf ear to it. How sad is that? And that's what amazed Jesus here on this occasion. So he left Nazareth, never to return again. Their rejection of Jesus was total. And he abandoned them to their choice. You see, when people reject the truth of the gospel and the message of salvation through Jesus, there is no more hope for them. He might call upon them, but he might not. Unbelief can become so final that the Lord will call no more and abandon us if we are in that state of unbelief to our own choice. You have that in Romans 1, verses 18 to 33. You read Romans chapter 9, that makes it very clear. So if you're an individual here this morning and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Saviour, you don't belong to the Lord. 
Don't continue on with this heart of unbelief because it's dangerous ground you're chatting on, folks. Dangerous, dangerous ground. The Lord may not call on you again. You may not have the opportunity of hearing the gospel and the Spirit of God speaking to your mind, to your conscience again. So be warned. But what about us as a church? What about us as a church? May it be that the Lord never abandons us as a church, right? May it never be. You might say, well, that can there be. The Lord's promised me that he'll never leave me or forsake me. I believe that's in relation to our positional salvation that we're accepted by God and we're made one of his children. But yes, he can abandon us. I'm thinking of the church in Ephesus. Remember Revelation chapter 2? The Spirit of God spoke to the church there through the Apostle John as he wrote that letter and, and he said, and, and he, he, he spoke of their, their, their goodness and how they're a wonderful church and, and they're doing so much right. But he says, you have left your first love. Repent and do the first, first works. Otherwise, you know what he was going to do? I will remove my lampstand from among you. In other words, I will remove my witness. So the Lord can abandon us, folks. He can abandon us. If we just carry on with a ho-hum and a, and, and, and a disobedient attitude and, and she'll be right mate kind of thing and disobedient to the word, God of words, God's word when we know we should be obedient, we are inviting the Lord as a church to abandon us and remove his witness and you know what we'll become? Nothing but clear, plain, old, dead orthodoxy with no witness, no power, no presence and we just go through the motions. We don't want to be a church like that, do we? Don't we want God's presence, God's power to see it working from us as a collective group and as a witness? Don't we want to be that light on a hill? Don't reject truth, folks. God's word. This is where the saying from this text that Jesus summed up, that a prophet has no honour, etc. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's where that came, this that came from. And we can become so familiar with what God has done with us that we treat it so lightly that it begins to breed contempt. And God says, be careful. I'll remove my witness. You know what he'll do? He'll leave and go somewhere else to a church elsewhere. He'll go with his message and his miracles. His testimony among us will be snuffed out and we'll be left in that fruitless desert of dead orthodoxy. May that never happen, folks. May it never happen. That's my prayer. And I'm sure I know it's your prayer as well. May we be challenged this morning. May we, they, those who embrace the Saviour, and if necessary, as individuals and as a church, fall in love with our Lord Jesus all over again. Let us revive in ourselves, do whatever it takes to have a hunger for His Word. Let us revive our hunger for His presence and His power through prayer and Bible study and fellowship and discipleship and worship. Let all those things become more important. Not just now and again things tagged on the end of our life. That's inviting disaster to us as individuals and us as a church. And as we do so, may it be that the Lord will bless us more than we could ever imagine so that we can glorify him and he might receive the glory and the praise and the honour that's due to his holy name. Amen.